need to be slaves to fear, Lord. We love you and we thank you, Lord. I pray that you open our hearts and minds to your word this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. You may be seated. Will you help me thank those who have led us in worship this morning? Hey, was there a sporting event last night that I didn't hear? Yeah, of course. No, what? Oh, yeah, that's the one I didn't hear about. <laughs> yeah. Uh, no, so I'm, I'm going to relegate myself to one. One Astros illustration. It'll come later. I'm just preparing you for that. Just one. Uh, today we're going to talk about practical theology. First Timothy chapter 5, uh, starting in verse 17. We'll go all the way to the end of uh, Timothy, First Timothy chapter 5. Uh, it's uh, contained in uh, a section of scripture called the pastoral epistles. Uh, 1 Timothy, Titus, 2 Timothy uh, contain a lot of pragmatic instruction. And when I was in seminary, we took this class called Practical Theology. We learned uh, to do pragmatically the things that pastors, elders, overseers do. So we went to the pool at Baylor in the middle of the student rec center and took turns like fake baptizing each other. And it looked really weird to everybody because at the first it looks like a service. You know, one person gets baptized and like, oh, cool, let's go watch this. And then you switch turns and then you get baptized, <laughs> right? Uh, which, which would make no sense to an outsider watching it if we're just developing the practice without the theological principles behind it. The reason we baptize the way we do, full immersion, the reason we say what we say about baptism is because of the theological principles of faith that we believe undergird everything that we do. When somebody goes under the water, it signifies their death to their old self, Jesus' death for us. When somebody comes out of the water, it signifies their new life in Christ, Jesus' resurrection, and it is a symbol of an an inward expression of faith. It's this outward expression of an inward thing that's happening in us already. If we don't know the theological backing behind that, it just looks like a bunch of guys went to the pool and started dunking each other. And so that's what Paul is doing uh, in Timothy and Titus and 2 Timothy is he's uh, doing these lessons in practical theology. The theology. Here's what it looks like to practice the principles that we believe. And specifically here, uh, it's in terms of elders. What I mean by elders, what, what, what we've been talking about, what you've heard here, what we've heard on the Beaumont campus, uh, is that the words for pastor, elder, overseer in Scripture are used interchangeably. So when I use the word pastor, that's what I'm talking about. I'm talking about anybody that you would consider a pastor that has that function in our church. And so there are several pastor, elder, overseers. So when we talk about that from 1 Timothy chapter 5's perspective, he's also talking about it in the realm of plurality. When he talks about the elders at Ephesus that Paul meets with and uh, discusses what's going to happen next in Acts chapter 20, it's, it's likely some of the same people that Timothy is going to be dealing with when he is leading in Ephesus. And so when he's talking to Timothy here, he has a few things in mind. In 1 Timothy, one of the things that Paul has in mind is to guard against false teaching. One of the things that he has in mind is what does it look like to bring charges against a pastor, elder, overseer? And what does it look like ultimately to support a pastor, elder, overseer? What do those things look like? And so there's a practicality, there's a pragmatism that Paul takes. Uh, spoiler alert, Baptist, he's going to tell him to drink some wine in this passage. We'll talk about that uh, too. But he, he's, he goes through some pragmatic things that he should do for himself and for ministry that all have theological backing behind them. So let's look at uh, 1 Timothy chapter 5, starting in 17. Let the elders who rule well be considered worthy of double honor, especially those who labor in preaching and teaching. For the scripture says, you shall not muzzle an ox when it treads out the grain, and the laborer deserves his wages. Do not admit a charge against an elder except on the evidence of two or three witnesses. As for those who persist in sin, rebuke them in the presence of all, so that the rest may stand in fear. In the presence of God and of Christ Jesus and of the elect angels, I charge you to keep these rules without prejudging, doing nothing from partiality. Do not be hasty in the laying on of hands, nor take part in the sins of others. Keep yourself pure. No longer drink only water, but use 
a little wine for the sake of your stomach and your frequent ailments. The sins of some people are conspicuous, going before them to judgment, but the sins of others appear later. So also, good works are conspicuous, and even those that are not cannot remain hidden. You pray with me? Father, I pray that you would show us in this passage, God, as Paul has spoken to Timothy instructions for this practical way in which we follow you that has theological reasoning behind it, God, I pray that we would seek the theological reasoning behind everything that we do, that it would be backed up not just by pragmatism or things that make sense to the world, but it would be backed up by our faith and our trust in you. God, I pray that we would be able to apply that to our own context this morning as we look at this passage. It's in your son's name we pray. Amen. So uh, right off the bat, I didn't choose this passage, right? This isn't like, oh, I'm going to be preaching in North of Sunday. Let's talk about how we should give double honor to those who preach and teach. It's in Scripture. We're going to talk about it, but it's part of the larger context of what we've been talking about. It was assigned to me. But just so we can take that awkwardness off of it and put it on somebody else, Justin's sitting right here, so we're just going to... No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> in the first service, I said he's not here, so we can say anything we want, but now you're here, so I guess we, I have to be nicer. No, <laughs> Uh, so no, but, but in reality, a lot of these things, uh, pastor, elder, overseer for this congregation's context do apply to Justin, so it would be right for us to think in terms of that when we talk about what it means, especially for the elders who rule well to be considered worthy of double honor. As we re read in this passage, we're going to look really quickly at uh, three things that we can draw out that we can know even about our own context from how Paul talks to Timothy. Number one. Everyone works together. Number two, consequences are for our good. And number three, we trust in God's justice. Firstly, everyone working together. Uh, when uh, we talk about uh, what Paul has to tell to Timothy, he, he's speaking to somebody who's done a lot of ministry with him, a co-laborer in the gospel, someone who knows the ins and outs of ministry, but he's going to have sort of a specific function here in this context with deciding or being a part of the process of deciding who is and who is not an elder and how to treat those who are elder, pastor, overseers. Uh, verse 17 is usually sometimes taken to mean in the first part of that verse that there is a certain type of elder, a ruling elder, uh, that is considered different from other elders. And then there is another difference that there are within that group of elders, another group of elders that are teaching and preaching. I agree. Uh, I think the series, the New International Commentary on the New Testament and the Old Testament is a really good series. Philip Towner is the one who wrote uh, the, the commentary for First. Uh, Timothy and Titus, uh, he disagrees with that, that there's some distinction between ruling elder and all other elders. He, he says that, that what the distinction is, is uh, elders who rule well and elders who do not rule well, because we have discussed qualifications for elders previously. We've also discussed what it looks like for false teaching or sin to creep in here and in other places in Paul. And so I, I agree with the assessment that pastor, elder, overseers have a leadership directional function over the congregation, there's no, uh, it's extra biblical for us to say there's ruling elders and then there's elders who don't rule. That's not the distinction that scripture makes. The distinction that scripture is making here is there's elders who rule well. There are pastors, elders, overseers who, who uh, uh, do their function within the congregation uh, exceptionally and there are those that need to be corrected. That's what he's going to be leading to here. Now, within that large, broad group of pastor, elder, overseers who rule well, there he does make a separate distinction for those who preach and teach. The word for teaching is just the word that's always translated teaching. The word for preaching is not always how we talk about preaching. The word for preaching there is those who work laboriously in the word. That's just what it means there. For those who, who, who labor to their own sacrifice in the word. That's what it's talking about, and that's what leads to that, that uh, conferring of double honor. We'll talk about what that means in a second. But I, was, uh, uh, I wasn't surprised when I learned this in seminary because I'd already been preaching for a couple years before I actually went to seminary, but in seminary they, they kind of laid out 
what a pastor's week uh, looks like. I don't know if this happens to you all the time, but people ask me all the time, uh, what do you do all week? And it's because, <laughs> and they don't I, don't, I don't think that that's necessarily offensive, but some, if you mean it like, I don't think you really do anything, so explain to me <laughs> what you do all week. Uh, but, uh, here's maybe some insight for you. The, the, the standard amount of time that we were taught in seminary that you're supposed to spend on a sermon, if you're doing it well, if you are an elder, pastor, overseer that leads well, 25 to 35 hours. Now, I don't know if you're math whizzes, but for a 40-hour work week, that doesn't leave a lot of time left. By the way, I don't know a single pastor that works a 40-hour <laughs> only work week. What happens there is all the ministry stuff that happens outside of preparing for preaching and teaching gets added onto it and gets added onto it. And calls and emergencies get added onto that. That's what we're talking about here, that there is a function, a sacrificial function that leaders in the church take on, not for a claim, not for personal benefit, but because they have been called to it, they've been confirmed by the congregation, and there is a way that they lead in the congregation towards this Christ ruling understanding of the church, that they're not in charge of the church, that Christ is the head of the church, and that the elders function in leading us all to work together in that understanding. And so it's not the distinction between those who rule and those who don't rule. There's no such thing as an elder who doesn't rule. It's those who rule well and those who don't rule well. And in that realm of those who rule well, there are those who teach and those who don't teach, but there is not somebody in there that doesn't have a leadership, functional, directional focus for the congregation. And here's how he explains it. Verse 18. For the scripture says, you shall not muzzle an ox when it treads out the grain, and the laborer deserves his wages. He's quoting two different places. He's quoting Deuteronomy. He's quoting a saying of Jesus, both sort of meaning the same thing. We all know, don't muzzle an ox while it's treading out the grain. We, we don't need to, oh, okay, you don't, okay. So, when oxen are, it, it, they could be stepping on the harvest, the grain harvest on the ground. They could be stepping on a slab, exposing the stuff that we eat out of grain, Right? Or they could be dragging a rock across it, whatever. However they are exposing what we eat out of the grain, uh, there, there could have been a practice to muzzle the ox so he doesn't eat what he is providing for others. Does that make sense? And so don't, how Paul is using don't muzzle the ox that's treading out the grain is there should be provision for the person that's providing for all of us. To, to divide the word rightly is a task that requires sacrifice. And so there should be some type of sustenance that the pastor, elder, overseer receives from that. Again, don't, don't see me pointing at myself. I'm just pointing at Justin, okay? There should be some kind of sustenance that is received from that. Sustenance, sustenance, provision is the term. And so when he gets to they are worthy of double honor at the beginning, I don't think what he means is they are worthy of double pay. I don't think that what Paul is asking for is for us to have a bunch of wealthy, jet-owning, $10,000 suit pastors because they're worthy of double honor. That's not how he's talking about honoring our pastors. The grain analogy is for sustenance, that there should be some provision because we're working together, because not everybody in this room is going to preach and teach. There are some that are going to, so there should be somebody that's able to get provision for themselves to be able to do that. That's how Paul makes the argument here. I also think he makes the argument in another place that a very good argument for bivocational pastor, elder, overseers that support themselves to not be a burden on the church. I think that is also a viable option for pastor, elder, overseers. The only thing that's not a viable option is for pastors to get super rich off their congregations. This is sustenance. Quoted from the Old Testament and Jesus, that Paul is showing what it looks like for us to honor pastor, elder, overseers, rightly. And so that's just the, 
if we're talking about financial honoring. I don't even think that the point is financial honoring. I think the point here is the affirmation and respect due to those who lead and rule over us. That there is this way that we behave when we work together that honors those who are in leadership over us instead of continuing to tamp them down. I had, my youth minister was my mentor when I first surrendered to ministry when I was 18. And he told me uh, that there are people that he knew in ministry within like one or two years that uh, quit, that stopped. And 18 year old, 10 foot tall, bulletproof me was like, they don't get it. They weren't serious about it. And he just like, he let me say those foolish things and didn't really correct me because he knew that if I had gone any further, and I did in ministry, that I would know the foolishness that was coming out of my mouth. I wish I could fit on one of these pages the number of times that I considered that. Leaving, quitting completely. It's real. Ministry is hard. It's not just what you see on a Sunday or a Wednesday. It's day in, day out. A lot of times, walking through the worst moments of their life with people, it is draining, spiritually, physically, emotionally. Last year, Christianity Today published an article, uh, The Pastors Are Not Okay, was the name of the article. At least 38% of current pastors in 2021, 38% of all pastors consider leaving the ministry for good. If you're looking at denomination by denomination, sometimes it was 50 or 60%. This means at least four or five of the pastor elder overseers at Calvary have considered that in the past year. And I think... I wouldn't be outside of the bounds to say it's probably higher than that at Calvary because of the things that we've experienced in the past few years. Evan Marbury, a pastor and counselor to pastors, puts it this way. This is from the article. They don't feel God's nearness. They don't feel other people that love them. They don't feel the ways that they are made in God's image and how their existence is actually delightful. When you get to that place, that's really concerning. Many pastors are ashamed or afraid of that place, even though Paul said it. If Paul said it, we should be able to say it. What he's talking about is 2 Corinthians chapter 1. We are under a pressure far beyond our ability to endure. He's talking about ministry. So much so that we despaired of life itself. Burnout, difficulty, depression, despair is to be expected for pastors, elders, overseers. That's why honoring just not materially, but with our words of affirmation, with our acceptance, with our continual support of them, as in life lived together, matters. I don't know the last time you went to the big thicket, but just in case you didn't know, it's all around you right now. Uh, there is, I don't know if you knew this, but there are carnivorous plants, insect, insectivorous plants. They eat flies that get trapped in them in the big thicket. This is a picture I took uh, last week on the pitcher plant trail. Uh, if you, it's just south of Warren. The Turkey Creek Trail is like 17 miles. You can get to it on the Turkey Creek Trail or you can go around and there's like just this one mile. It's, a lot of it is, has those boards that you can walk on. And there's hundreds of these right now. They're not supposed to be there. Hundreds of these. But because seasons are bipolar and mercurial in Texas, we can get swamp fog rain at the end of October and then it'd be 80 degrees the next day. Pitcher plants sprouted up out of nowhere. So we could go and see. I saw. You can go see a fly get eaten by a plant. I saw it happen in real time. Because of unexpected refreshment. 
Pitcher plants were going to be back. They're going to be back next year. But because of unexpected refreshment, there was growth. Most of the time, I can tell you from experience in ministry, what's unexpected is hurt and pain and sorrow. That's what happens. That's the next surprise that you get. That makes unexpected refreshment so much sweeter. That's what I think we're talking about with double honor here. That there are ways that we can speak truth and life and love into our leaders. Because we should take this responsibility seriously to show honor to those who lead well. We should also take the responsibility to hold those accountable who do not lead well seriously. Because consequences, point number two, are for our good. Paul really gets to this uh, in verses 19 through 21, somewhat in 22. But 19, do not admit a charge against an elder except on the evidence of two or, th- or three witnesses. He again begins with this real, pragmatic solution to dealing with charges brought against an elder, which happens all the time. I've seen cases in which pastor elder overseers were protected by this. In, in a church that I served in early on, the music minister was accused by one person of doing something that they, they thought he, they saw him do at the end of a hallway by one person, and because there weren't two or three witnesses, this was something that the church didn't take seriously, and it was something that he didn't even do. He thought that he, they thought he was talking to somebody else in the hallway. There wasn't even anybody else in the hallway. When they, when they talked to that person, they weren't even there. So it could have been something that went off the rails because of this pragmatic solution. There was protection for pastor elder overseers. Now, when that's not the case, when there's an actual charge, it works directly in the right direction also because in the case of one or two, uh, two or three witnesses, Two, being required. Three, being preferable. There are ways to hold people accountable, including pastor, elder, overseers for their actions, for their sin. Uh, uh, First uh, Timothy would also include for their incorrect doctrine. It gives us this practical way to embody our theological principles. That there are ways that we can hold and should hold people accountable for their good. At the beginning of this very letter, Alexander and Hymenaeus have made a shipwreck of their faith. They're handed over to Satan so they may not may be taught not to blaspheme. So that there may be something important done in their lives through the confrontation by the congregation of their sin. That's how it's supposed to work. Sometimes we need to see ourselves, our leaders, our context in regards to this practical theology instead of just a mere pragmatism, though that's why Paul continues in this. As for those who persist in sin, rebuke them in the presence of all. Now, whether this means in the presence of all the congregation or all the elders is not clear, but uh, certainly so that the rest may stand in fear has a connotation for the rest of the elders, that they may see that sin is taken seriously, that there will be consequences to their action, that there need to be checks and balances set up so that people don't run away with power or sin or authority used in a tyrannical fashion. And here's how it ends in verse 21. Not not only rebuke them, which could mean a lot of things. It could mean correct them until and give them chances to be corrected. It could also mean uh, up and to including dismissal for their persistence in sin. But he he ends this sort of section in uh, verse 21 by saying, In the presence of God and of uh, Christ Jesus and of the elect angels, I charge you to keep these rules without prejudging. Do nothing from partiality. He brings in this eschatological end times component that God is ultimately in charge of the process. So if you try to take it over, if you try to insert your own will or desire into it, it will ultimately be dealt with. He's leading to that. But sometimes we need to see, especially when when perhaps we've given too much authority or too much blind trusting to human leaders, we need to see through layers of deception and misrepresentation to judge contexts and persons rightly. Does anybody know what this is a picture of? 
It is concept art. Does anybody know what it's for? If it wasn't in the first service? I gotcha. It's Lord of the Rings. Just uh, Okay. It's Lord of the Rings. This is, yes, thank you. <laughs> and we're done. No. Uh, it's it's uh, the only drawing that Tolkien ever did of Sauron. The bad guy from Lord of the Rings. Every other conception we have of Sauron, somebody else drew or somebody else came up with. The Peter Jackson films, I love them, but they made up that version of Sauron. This is the only picture he ever drew because what Sauron looked like wasn't important. You know, in the, in the book, Sauron has a physical body. He's not just the all-seeing eye, right? The, in, in the Peter Jackson films, he has a physical body. He's there, but he's never seen. He needs to be discerned. It can be deceptive when the people that we have vested with leadership betray us or hurt us. It's certainly manipulative. And so Paul takes the injunction to honor just as seriously as he takes the injunction to provide consequences. That we should keep these instructions as close at hand as the ones to affirm. We should know and have good reasons, multiple witnesses, when we take an action of church discipline against an elder overseer. Because we're not in charge of the church. It's not our church. It's Christ's church. And if we're not leading in an adoption of that premise, then we are not leading well. Ultimately, because of the messiness that no one in this room needs to be told about of church life and leadership, at, at some point we just have to trust in this eschatological hope that Christ gives us. Last point. We trust in God's justice. Paul wants to show Timothy what it looks like to work in concert and cooperation and collaboration in accordance with God's judgment in every situation, this decision of who should be or shouldn't be an elder, this decision of how charges should come and charges should be accepted, shouldn't ultimately be in the hands of humans or human authorities or human institutions as a whole. He marries the pragmatic and the spiritual together. How Towner puts it is that God will eventually pull all those loose threads together that elude human administration. We have to trust when trusting is hard. When we see ministries or entertainment venues thrive, we have to trust that God is in control. When we see injustice go unpunished, we have to trust that God is in control. And I have to admit that I am bad at this. That I need to trust that God is in control. I need the hope that comes from that because sometimes it seems hopeless. At the end of the section, Paul touches on the hope that we should have Not only that certain inconspicuous sins will be dealt with, but he doesn't end it there. In, in verse, so verse 23, he says, uh, no long, we're not skipping over it, no longer drink only water, but use a little wine for the sake of your stomach and your frequent ailments. He could be talking about some of this pressure that pastors deal with. He could be so, talking about some ailment that Timothy has that he is advising him to uh, drink some wine to go along with. But again, it's a pragmatic, practical concern that goes along with what he is doing in leading and providing this oversight function for the church. The sins of some people are conspicuous going before them to judgment, but the sins of others appear later. So also, good works are conspicuous, and even those that are not, that is, are not conspicuous, cannot remain hidden. Those, who, those that are not seen 
readily will not remain that way. And so what do we do when it seems like the conspicuous sins of some are not going before them to the judgment? We rest in the truth and the knowledge of God's judgment, and it's hard because we see it on the ground. We, we don't see the ultimate end. It's hard because we continue to get beat down and we continue to experience the effects of sins going unpunished. And it can lead to despair. When we say heaven's coming, when we say Jesus' is return, when we say he is risen, when we look forward to this eschatological hope, we're not just saying it's going to be so great when he comes back. We're, going to, we're saying it's going to be so great when he comes back and rights all the wrongs that we cannot and have not righted. Jesus coming back is great news for us. It's not great news for everybody. It's not good news for those who stand in the judgment. It's great news for us. My, my uh, grandma used to read me a book uh, called Touche Turtle. Does anybody remember it? Touche Turtle? Anybody? Okay. It was a, it's like what you would think. It's a turtle. It's a cartoon turtle. He wears like a feather in his cap and he has like a sword. He goes around righting wrongs all day and at the end of the day he says, what was wrong? I made right. Good night. And we all clap and feel good at the end of it. I don't know that I've, I've really experienced that yet but I know what it's like to hope for that. I know what it's like to hope beyond hope that wrongs will be righted. That I can't do anything about it. That's what we're doing when we, when we affirm even the inconspicuous good works of our pastors, elders, overseers. We are saying, we see you. We see you struggle. We see you hurt. We want to affirm everything that you're doing that we see and that we do not see. Uh, I didn't tell you I was going to do this in the last service, but I told you I was going to do it here. Will you, uh, Justin and family that's in the room, will, will y'all come up? I didn't, Melissa, I didn't tell you either, sorry. All family, yeah. So, I didn't ask him if I could do this because he would probably tell me no. Uh, Paul takes the admonition to punish wrong behavior just as seriously as he takes the admonition to recognize right behavior. That's what he's talking about when he talks about double honor, affirming what this man and his family suffer on behalf of us to sacrifice, to lead. And so I think it would be really great if we could just all come up here and pray for them. There are conspicuous ways that we have seen them uh, serve and suffer for us. There are a whole lot of inconspicuous ways. Nobody knows. We, we got room. We can, we can squeeze in here. Yeah. We're not worried about what it looks like. We're just, we just want to love on them. We know how he teaches and what he does. We know how Melissa serves and what she does, but we can't see what they do with integrity without reward when no one's looking. We can't see what they also do with integrity when they suffer for leading us well. And so I'd just like for us to enter into a time of praying for them. If you can get close enough to put a hand on them somewhere or put a hand on somebody next to you. We're going to pray for them.
Father, we lift up to you Justin and Melissa and Jonathan and Josh and Marin. God, we pray that they would feel affirmed and refreshed uh, in a desert. God, that we wouldn't use words like healing um, emptily, but we would use them denoting the power that you have to heal and the power that you use through us to do that. God, I pray that you would speak to people in the, in the spirit right now in this room that need to come alongside them and affirm them and encourage them and perhaps do things on behalf of them the same way that they've done things on behalf of us, the same way that they've walked alongside me when I'm suffering, when I'm hurting, the same way that they've exhibited the qualities of servant leadership, the way that Justin has led well. All right, God, I pray that we would be a people, a congregation that lavishes double honor upon you. We thank you for the way that you've used them, God. I pray that you would continue to use them that you would continue to grow us through just our relationship with them. That you would give them unexpected refreshment. And God, that you would protect them. Protect them from evil. We thank you and we love you for who they are to us. It's in your son's name we pray these things. Amen.